The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Magazine form, 1913. Book form, 1918. This copy, 1963. The Gods of Mars was serialized in five parts in the All Story magazine, from January 1913 to May 1913. Once again, we can make a comparison between the covers from the first edition and this 1963 edition. Frank E. Schoonover's cover features John Carter in disguise. He is disguised as a thern. He is wearing a golden wig, and the headband has a precious gem of Mars. He is attempting to get on a black pirate airship, and you can see a black pirate pointing a gun at him. Now, the 1963 cover by Bob Abbott takes the airship and makes it look more like a spaceship over Mars. There is a hatch opening, but we don't see the black pirates of Barsoom. Neither do we see John Carter disguised as a thern. For those who saw the review of A Princess of Mars, yes, I'm talking now about therns. They are a white race of priests who live in what is considered the afterlife the afterlife is actually a physical location on Mars. When people's lives are over, they sail down a river into this location. Here, the plantmen and the thern kill them and eat them. Not much of an afterlife. But let's go back to the beginning. There is a foreword to this novel by Edgar Rice Burroughs. In it, he talks about finding the body of his uncle and burying it in a crypt that can only be opened from the inside. In his inheritance, he finds notebooks with details of John Carter's adventures on Mars. This book comes from that notebook. Then we're put into a first-person narrative of John Carter for the rest of the book. Let me read from Chapter 1. The Gods of Mars, Chapter 1, The Plant Men. As I stood under the bluff before my cottage on that clear cold night in the early part of March 1886, the noble Hudson flowing like the gray and silent specter of a dead river below me, I felt, again, the strange, compelling influence of the mighty god of war, my beloved Mars, which for ten long and lonesome years I had implored with outstretched arms to carry me back to my lost love. Not since that other March night in 1866, when I had stood without that Arizona cave in which my still and lifeless body lay wrapped in the similitude of earthly death, had I felt the irresistible attraction of the god of my profession. With arms outstretched toward the red eye of the great star, I stood praying for a return of that strange power, which twice had drawn me through the immensity of space, praying as I had prayed on a thousand nights before during the long ten years that I had waited and hoped. Suddenly, a qualm of nausea swept over me. My senses swam, my knees gave beneath me, and I pitched headlong to the ground upon the very verge of the dizzy bluff. Instantly, my brain cleared, and there swept back across the threshold of my memory the vivid picture of the horrors of that ghostly Arizona cave. Again, as on that far-gone night, my muscles refused to respond to my will, and again, as though even here, upon the banks of the placid Hudson, I could hear the awful moans and rustling of the fearsome thing which had lurked and threatened me from the dark recesses of the cave. I made the same mighty and superhuman effort to break the bonds of the strange anesthesia which held me, and again came the sharp click as of the sudden parting of a taut wire, and I stood naked and free beside the staring lifeless thing that had so recently pulsed with the warm red lifeblood of John Carter. With scarcely a parting glance, I turned my eyes again towards Mars lifted my hands toward his lurid rays and waited. Nor did I have long to wait, for scarce had I turned ere I shot with the rapidity of thought into the awful void before me. There was the same instant of unthinkable cold and utter darkness that I had experienced twenty years before, and then I opened my eyes in another world, beneath the burning rays of a hot sun, which beat through a tiny opening in the dome of the mighty forest in which I lay. So John Carter is back on Mars, 
but he is in this geographic region which is considered the afterlife. There are many threats to his life and he fights through them all. Eventually, he is reunited with his friend Tars Tarkas, a green Martian. By the way, Edgar Rice Burroughs likes using colors for the different races of Mars. The green Martians are tall, insect-like creatures. The red Martians are humanoid and have a copper tone to their skin. Deja, the princess of Mars, is one of the red Martians. In this novel, we're introduced to the white Martians, or the Therns. They are an unholy priesthood, literally feeding on those who go to an afterlife. John Carter tries to convince his companions that this is not the afterlife. This is simply a deception that the Therns are propagating on the rest of Mars. From page 45. We have the right to escape if we can, I answered. Our own moral senses will not be offended if we succeed, for we know that the fabled life of love and peace in the blessed Valley of Dor is a rank and wicked deception. We know that the valley is not sacred. We know that the holy therns are not holy, that they are a race of cruel and heartless mortals, knowing no more of the real life to come than we do. John Carter needs his companions to believe in him so that they can escape this manufactured afterlife. In fact, when John Carter is captured by the Therns, here's what he says about his prison. Constant confinement below ground had wrought odd freaks upon their skins. They more resemble corpses than living beings. Many are deformed, others maimed, while the majority, Thuvia explained, are sightless. Thuvia is now a companion of John Carter and Tars Tarkas. She has saved their lives from the therns. As they lay sprawled about the floor, sometimes overlapping one another, again in heaps of several bodies, they suggested instantly to me the grotesque illustrations that I had seen in copies of Dante's Inferno. And what more fitting comparison? Was this not indeed a veritable hell, peopled by lost souls, dead and damned beyond all hope? John Carter's idealism, loyalty, and fighting ability gain many friends. He has an entourage of people from all Martian races. This episode starts to play out like an Indiana Jones movie. A dangerous, cannibalistic religion. Jungles. Temples. Underground dwellings. Airships. And long-lost lovers. Can John Carter and his friends escape the afterlife of Mars? And if they do, will they be accepted back into the land of the living? About halfway through the novel, there is another person that John Carter meets in this land. I'm not going to say too much about this character, but the reader can see the reveal a mile away. It takes 20 to 25 pages before Burroughs reveals who this character actually is. In this sequel, Burroughs seems to be trying to top himself. There's more action, battles, revelations, and a high body count. When John Carter comes to Mars, Martians die. Do we get that happy ending? Or is it a cliffhanger? Well, there are eight more novels. If you like the first book, then I think you'll enjoy the second book. I felt that the second book went a bit over the top, reminding me a bit of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There is a very dark narrative running through this novel. I think when it comes to sequels, there's a diminishing return. Often it's formulaic, and the action gets more and more absurd. Now that can be fun. In this case, I found it quite dark. But for its action and historical importance, I give The Gods of Mars 7 out of 10. Perhaps you're interested in the history of science fiction. I would say that you only need to read the first novel, The Princess of Mars, to get an understanding of what Edgar Rice Burroughs is doing and why it's significant. Until next time, keep reading.